the character of Christopher Boone really doesn't make things that easy for poets, I have to say, because he takes things very, very seriously. Figures of speech confuse him, simile, metaphor, hyperbole. These are all sort of needless ornamentations and he's not sure why people bother with them. So in order to offer him a poem, I had to take, you know, uh, I had to take an unusual route. I'm gonna read uh, a few poems, uh, just like four or five really short ones. Uh, and we'll start with this one where I'm just trying to make it easy. This is called The Verb To Be. When I say I'm made of toy animals, you assume it's a metaphor. It's not a metaphor. My face is full of tigers and zebras. My chest is a parcel of birds. I've never lied to you, never tried to hide the world in something like the world. There really is a gold bell in your pillow. The child you were is the child you are, and that child is watched by ghosts. I'm not mad at you, not in the least, except for a little blue horse by my hip. She kicks when you talk about poetry. No, not mad, I'm concerned. You were born too old to believe all that stuff about art. The sooner you treat the sun like family, the sooner it will use your name. And while Christopher uh, uh, Boone uh, may have a hard time with poetry, thankfully, the author of the book, Mark Hatton, does not. Uh, he, not long after reading, releasing The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, he released this book, uh, a collection of his poems called the, the Talking Horse and the Sad Girl and the Village Under the Sea. And while he has no problem with complexity of metaphor, uh, he is very clearly the only per person that could have created Christopher Boone. Uh, he's got a, a fascinating a voice that runs through all of these poems, one that seems to be sort of astonished to be alive and like his protagonist, constantly trying to figure out why people do what they do. This is a short poem of her, his, and it's kind of a primer, just telling you how to act around people, or at least how to act at dinner. This is called A Rough Guide. Be polite at the reception desk. Not all the knives are in the museum. The waitresses know that a nice boy is formed in the same way as a deck chair. Pay for the beer and send flowers. Introduce yourself as Richard. Do not refer to what somebody did at a particular time in the past. Remember every Friday, we used to go for a walk. I walked, you walked. Everything in the past is irregular. This steak is very good. Sit down, there is no wine but there is ice cream. Eat slowly. I have many matches. We'll hear from him again in a moment. What Christopher Boone does like, rather than ornaments of speech, uh, are, are the facts. And it's fascinating how throughout the novel, as a way to sort of find his balance, he will tell you facts. He will tell you facts about science and nature, mathematics, his favorite subject, and occasionally share with you what is true and what is false about what the people around him believe. My way into this particular poem was to start with a fact, uh, was to start with uh, a term used in mountain climbing. This poem is called Ascender. The isolation of a mountain is the distance between it and another of equal size. The isolation of Mount Kilimanjaro is about 6,000 miles. The isolation of this desk, including the vase of pink clematis, is just a few steps to the window, the blue cup you left on the sill, full of sunlight now. Mount Everest has no isolation, and after dark, neither does this room. It's so high, so breathlessly above the night, the moon is an ambulance with its siren off. It sounds wrong, doesn't it? I mean, you'd think there'd be lots of isolation with so much nothing around. 
leave it to mountain climbers to plant a flag in loneliness and then misname it. Sometimes I think the earth turns so that God doesn't have to get up and find the remote and keep both hands on a drink. Beyond this world, it's all diamonds and black fish. So why is there separateness? Why can't I feel what you touch or remember your days? Oh. Christopher Boone uh, does puzzle all the time at what separates people. He would like us all to sort of behave in much the same way, uh, or at least agree on what's going to be for dinner and what are good colors and bad colors. His creator, as I say, Mark Haddon, though, um, uh, is filled with a different kind of wonder. And uh, Carl doesn't know this, but I'm pulling a last second substitution. I was going to read a different poem by Mark Haddon, but I've since uh, rehearsal discovered this one. It's shorter, Carl. Um, and I don't think you need to know anything about this piece, except um, that it is set in uh, Yorkshire. He's going to make a reference to an area known as Hebden Bridge. Uh, and in the poem, he's just going to look down into a gully and notice that there's a silver Ford Escort, which seems to have crashed into the River Calder. And he's going to do like a lot of poets do, which is look at everything and wonder how it got there. This is called the River Car. The way it's park, nose down between the wet rocks, in the leaf light of the gorge, water pouring through the windscreen and the tires blown, as if the naiads put their fairy horses out out to grass and cruise to the night in silver escorts. Or as if three boys from Hebden Bridge got bored and stole a car and drove it halfway to the moors, grew bored again, then rolled it from the muddy track and watched it hammer through the trees until it came to rest a hundred yards below. And as the echo died away, the car they drove in dreams kept floating downstream and the boys they'd never be rode every bend of starlit water to the ocean. Last poem. This is your one poem warning. Uh, I like where that poem leaves us. I like the wonder it leaves us with. And I tried to sort of reconcile all of the themes that I was struggling here, uh, both Christopher Boone's seriousness and his wonder. Uh, all of the memories that inhabiting his life conjured for me, and just the very curious kind of wonder that Mark Haddon seems to aim at the world. And this is a new piece, uh, and uh, no introduction, it's my last piece. Thank you very much for your attention. This is tried to be. I think our parents wanted to be naked for a few hours. So Jack and I found ourselves outside staring at each other like a pair of library lions. We didn't speak for the first while, maybe 10 minutes, which was longer back then. I recall cars passing on Arden, pine sounds, when Jack said, let's be old, as if to say, this will teach them to kick us out. So we bent our backs, bowed our legs, and called each other funny. Then we walked in rickety circles, coughing. Jack said, I remember when all this was wild land. I remember dinosaurs, I said. I remember when there was only one germ and one rock. I remember when everything was black fire. Toward the end, we got talking about death, how we were probably so old now. We only had minutes to live, perhaps seconds. Or maybe we were already dead. The game got so real, it felt like gambling. By the time our parents called us in, we were hugging, we were hugging feebly, all but weeping. Goodbye, Sonny. Oh, goodbye, Sonny. My time has come. Yes, my time too. And we entered the house amazed to be seven again, live as spoon. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Wow. That was